Welcome to the next Bio6 lecture on the nervous system. So this is part two of our three-part lecture on the nervous system. And this lecture, we're going to focus in on the electrical signal that moves through neurons. I've been showing you this uh, electrical system, electrical signal cartoon uh, since we began talking about the uh, about the nervous system and I've been saying that that's the nerve signal it's an, it's an electrical signal that moves through that moves through neurons so we're going to learn more about that electrical signal in this part of the lecture and I'll tell you up front this part of the lecture on the the electrical signal that goes through the neurons is complicated so it's going to be one of the 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 harder lectures of, of this course so just brace yourself for a little bit of uh, complexity put on your put on your thinking caps Okay, well, the official name for that electrical signal is the action potential. I've just been calling it the electrical nerve signal, but its official name is the action potential. And the term potential can mean voltage. And so it, it kind of relates to the fact that I, I've been telling you this is an electrical signal because it's uh, the nature of the signal is a voltage change um, inside the neuron. That's why they call it the action potential, the action voltage, in other words. Okay, in the, um, in the lecture outline, I define the action potential as the electrical nerve signal that travels uh, through the axon. So we're mostly going to be focusing on the um, action potential as it moves through the axon of the neuron. Okay, so let's zoom in on the axon. Let's zoom in right there at the, at the beginning of the axon right there so we can take a little bit better look at the action potential. Okay, now I'm about to do kind of a color change here. In this cartoon of the neuron, I've been showing the, the inside, the cytoplasm of the neuron is yellow, and I've been showing the outside of the neuron as white, and the membrane of the neuron is black. Uh, so here comes the color change. I'm now going to start showing the inside of the neuron. The cytoplasm is kind of a dark blue, the outside is black, and the membrane of the, of the neuron is that yellow right there. Okay, well, before we discuss the action potential, I want to first uh, establish some kind of basic concepts about the neuron when it's resting. And when I say a resting neuron, I mean it's not carrying a nerve signal. It's not carrying uh, an action potential. Okay, so one of these basic concepts about the resting neuron that I want you to know is this. Um, resting neurons are negatively charged. They have a, a negative charge inside them. And I'm going to represent that by um, some little negative signs uh, in see the, inside the neuron right there. All right, now um, we might ask, well, you know, exactly how negatively charged is, is the inside of the neuron? Well, there are devices um, used by electricians called voltmeters. And, you know, most voltmeters are large enough that you would hold them in your hand. But imagine a super tiny voltmeter, so tiny that we can stick its probe. We can stick the end of the voltmeter that measures the voltage. Let's imagine a voltmeter so tiny that we can stick its probe actually inside a neuron cell. So if we had one of these tiny, tiny voltmeters, oh yeah, so it says MV. That stands for millivolts. Uh, uh, milli, each millivolt is one one thousandth of a volt. And so we're going to be measuring the uh, voltages of the neuron in terms of millivolts. Anyway, let's imagine we had a voltmeter that was super tiny and we can actually stick its probe, its testing end, inside a neuron. And so let's imagine doing that. The voltmeter would tell us exactly how negative the neuron is inside and it would say negative 70 millivolts. So yes, when a neuron is resting, not carrying an action potential, the neuron is negatively charged inside and the, the, the amount of neg negative charge is negative 70 millivolts. And when a neuron is in that state, when it's negative 70 millivolts, we say that the neuron is polarized. Okay, now, um, so you might be wondering, okay, so resting neurons are polarized at negative 70 millivolts. So how did they get negative inside? Well, um, it has to do with ions. Um, Let's imagine uh, some ions. And remember that ions are electrically charged atoms or molecules, and different ions have different charges, like uh, sodium ions have a positive one electrical charge. Potassium ions are just like sodium ions. They have a 
positive one electrical charge. And, but there are also negatively charged ions, like chloride ions, for example, have a negative one uh, charge to them. And there are more ions than these. You know, just uh, If you look at our lecture from the beginning of the semester on chemistry, uh, just to give an example, um, calcium ions have a charge of plus 2. And there's a type of ion called a phosphate ion that has a charge of negative 3. But in this lecture, we'll focus in on just these uh, ions here. And so, yeah, so notice that uh, uh, sodium ions have plus 1. Potassium ions have plus 1, the same as sodium ions. And the charges on chloride ions are negative 1 each. OK, so imagine a cell started off with equal numbers of negative ions and positive ions, like you see here, right? Um, and so I think you would agree, then, that that cell would have 0 net charge, right? Because the number of positive charges inside the cell exactly equal the number of negative charges inside the cell, right? Uh, yeah, so if the cell has equal numbers of positive and negative ions inside, sure, it, it wouldn't be negative inside. The cell would be neutral, 0 overall total charge. But imagine that the cell had some way of kicking out sodium ions. So imagine the, the cell had some way of exporting sodium ions. Well, if it did that, then you would end up with more negative charges inside the cell than positive charges, right? Because when you kick out a sodium ion, you're kicking a positive charge out of the cell. And so the negative charges would begin to predominate. And so that's how neurons get negatively charged inside, by kicking out sodium ions. So you might be wondering, well, how exactly do neuron cells kick out the sodium ions? And the answer is this protein right here. Um, give it a second. There it is right there. It, takes sodium ions from the inside of the neuron, and it pumps them to the outside. Now, when it's doing that, it happens to also bring in some potassium ions. But notice that it only brings in two potassium ions as it kicks out three sodium ions. So overall, it's removing positive charges from the inside of the neuron, and that's what allows the negative charges of, uh, inside the neuron to eventually predominate. And that's why the neuron gets to negative 70 millivolts. Now, does this protein look familiar to you? Well, it might. We talked about it uh, earlier in the semester. It's called the sodium-potassium pump. And it's an important protein. Uh, it, it comes up several times in, in this semester in our discussion of, of physiology. Yeah, so the sodium-potassium pump is a membrane protein. Uh, it pumps three sodium ions out as it simultaneously pumps two potassium ions in. But like I said, since it's removing more positive charges than it's putting into the cell, the overall effect is to build up negative charge inside the neuron. And that's how the neuron gets its negative charge, thanks to this sodium-potassium pump. Um, the sodium-potassium pump is an active transport protein, meaning it uses energy to move those solutes across the membrane. It uses ATP energy uh, as its energy source, which makes it a primary active transport protein. OK, uh, so yeah, so that's how the uh, cell gets its negative, the neuron gets its negative charge inside is thanks to the sodium potassium pump. Now here in this cartoon, I'm only showing one sodium potassium pump in the neuron's membrane. And there's, there's actually a lot more. The, the, the neuron's membrane is full of these sodium potassium pumps. And they're just constantly running. They're constantly kicking out sodium ions and, and putting in potassium ions uh, into the neuron. OK, so for the rest of this lecture, I'm going to make the sodium potassium pumps invisible, but just realize that they're always there and they're constantly doing what you're seeing here, kicking out the sodium ions and pumping the, the potassium ions into inside the neuron. Well, so that's what makes the inside of the neuron negative is the sodium potassium pump. But the sodium potassium pump has another effect. It builds up some concentration gradients of those ions, the sodium ions and the potassium ions. Since it's pumping the sodium ions out of the neuron, you get a sodium concentration gradient so that there's a higher concentration of sodium ions outside the neuron than there are inside. And since it's pumping the potassium ions inside the neuron, you get a concentration gradient of potassium ions where there's a higher concentration of potassium ions inside the neuron than outside. Matter of fact, will we have them. There we go, yes. So when a re neuron is resting, I want you to know not only that it's negatively charged inside at negative 70 millivolts, but I also want you to know there's a sodium ion concentration gradient and a potassium ion concentration gradient with the higher concentration of sodium ions being outside the cell and the higher concentration of potassium ions being inside the cell.
Now, remember from our previous discussions of concentration gradients, all solutes want to diffuse from their high concentration side to their low concentration side. So think of those sodium ions outside the neuron as really trying to get into the neuron. They want to get in because that's going down their concentration gradients, and that's what solutes want to do. And likewise, think of these potassiums as really wanting to get out of the, uh, of the neuron because that's down their concentration gradient. And again, all solutes always want to go down their concentration gradients. OK, so like I said, I'm going to make the sodium potassium pumps uh, invisible from here on in, but just realize they're always there in the, uh, in the membrane. And because of those sodium potassium pumps, neurons get negative 70 millivolts negatively charged inside. And they have these sodium ion concentration gradient and also potassium ion concentration gradient, like you see here. So those are the resting conditions of a neuron, negative inside, sodium ions higher concentration outside, and potassium high ions higher concentration inside. So now let's begin to discuss the action potential. You know that the electrical signal that goes through, uh, goes through the axon. The key protein involved in the action potential is called a voltage-gated sodium channel. Here's an example of one right here. OK, yeah, so this thing that I'm showing here is a uh, membrane channel protein called a voltage-gated sodium channel. Uh, and I define it in the, uh, in the uh, lecture handout as uh, it's a channel protein in the axon membrane that, when it opens, allows sodium ions to flow into the axon. Um, so uh, for right now, don't worry about the voltage-gated part of its name. Just the important part for right now is it's a sodium ion channel. And so it allows sodium ions to pass through the, uh, through the uh, membrane of the, of the neuron. And remember what I talked about earlier. All solutes want to flow down their concentration gradients. They all want to diffuse from their high concentration side to their low concentration side. And that direction, right, for the sodium ions is into the neuron. So all this voltage-gated sodium channel has to do is open up, and that will allow those neurons to, uh, uh, to flow right in. And so when I click the button here, we're going to see that. Oh, yeah, there it is. It's the voltage-gated sodium channel. All right. So it opens up, and it allows a bunch of uh, sodium ions to come in. It eventually closes again, but it, the point is that it allows a bunch of sodium ions to rush into the, uh, uh, into the, uh, into the axon. OK, now, uh, when one of those voltage-gated sodium channels opens up, it always allows exactly enough sodium ions to enter so that in its region, meaning right there at the bottom of it, so in its region, it manages to make the voltage 30, positive 30 millivolts. So just to remember, the neuron in general is at negative 70 millivolts, but this region right here, right below the voltage-gated sodium um, channel, uh, it, it let in enough sodium ions, so that became positive 30 millivolts. OK, and um, Maybe I'd better just sort of recap that concept. Um, oh, yeah, actually, before I do. So we say that that region of the neuron uh, has become depolarized. Uh, that, that, that phrase depolarized means that it is now at positive 30 millivolts. Good. So uh, what I was going to say is let me just kind of recap that. Let me go back in time. So uh, when the neuron is resting, the entire neuron is at negative 70 millivolts. And we say that the neuron is polarized. When a voltage-gated sodium channel opens, it always, uh, there it is, it's negative 70 millivolts all over, all over the neuron, uh, including right beneath the channel. But when that voltage-gated sodium ion channel opens, it always allows just enough sodium ions to come in so that it becomes positive 30 uh, millivolts right there below the, uh, below the sodium, voltage-gated sodium ion channel. OK, and yeah, and we now say that that spot on the neuron right there below the voltage-gated sodium uh, ion channel when it reaches positive 30 millivolts. We say that that area has depolarized. OK, um, so I'm going to start showing this zone of positive electrical charge as kind of a, a, a yellow-looking glow. And so where you see the um, yellow-looking glow is most intense, that means where most of the positive electrical field is located, right? Because that's where the sodium ions are. But you know that 
ions tend to disperse, uh, you know, uh, get more spread out. And so if you go a little bit further away from it, notice I show less yellow glow, that means there's less and less positive charge, you know, the positive electrical field is getting weaker and weaker, the further you go away from that positive 30 zone right there. So yeah, if you were to get out your little voltmeter and measured right there below the voltage gated sodium ion channel, after it has opened, yeah, you'd find positive 30 millivolts. But if you were to move slightly further away, there we go, you'd still see an effect. I mean, it's still more positive than negative 70, the you know the general resting voltage of the neuron. Um, it's still more positive than the neuron's resting voltage, but it's not quite as positive as it was here. It's not the positive 30 because we're moving farther away from those uh, positive sodium ions. And if we were to move our little voltmeter even further away, uh, we'd find even less of a change relative to the relative to the neuron's resting potential of negative 70. You know, it's now negative 20 millivolts if we move this far away. So notice that's still more positive than the neuron's negative 70, uh, but it's less than the positive 30 when we were right under that voltage-gated ion channel. And I think you get the idea. If we move farther away still, then um, there's still a little bit of an effect from those positive charges at this spot. The uh, axon has a potential, a voltage of negative 60 millivolts, uh, so it's that's still more positive than the negative 70 uh, of the of the axon in general, but it's obviously um, not as positive as the positive 30 zone right there below the below the uh, uh, voltage gated sodium channel. And if you move far, farther enough away, there wouldn't be any effect at all, right? If you move farther away, far enough away. Uh, from where that channel let the sodium ions in, there'd be pretty much zero electrical field at that point. And so the the inside of the axon at that point would be at its resting potential of, of negative 70. Okay, yeah, so um, that's the basic idea. When one of these voltage-gated sodium ion channels opens, it lets in enough sodium ions to make right below it positive 30 millivolts and we see that it has depolarized at that spot but the farther you go the less of a positive uh, charge effect there is and if you go far enough away then there is none and that zone of the axon is at the standard resting potential negative 70 millivolts okay so i've just been showing you this one voltage gated sodium ion channel right here at the beginning of the axon. Well, as it turns out, there are these voltage-gated uh, sodium channels all along the axon, from the very beginning of the axon here, you know, right next to the cell body, to the very end of the axon, right next to the axon terminal. Uh, all along it, you find these voltage-gated uh, sodium ion channels. Um, okay, so, but notice that the sodium ions that this first voltage-gated sodium ion channel let in, they do have an effect on the voltage of this next one's environment, right? Because uh, some of that electrical charge um, is still affecting this one's environment. So it's, it's, this one's environment is not at the negative 70 uh, that it was before this one let in the sodium ions. It's going to be more positive than negative 70. You know, it's not going to be positive 30 here because that's only right there where the sodium ions are most concentrated. But there is going to be some positive uh, effect here. It's not going to be negative 70. And why is that important? Well, it's important because these voltage, uh, the voltages that are around a voltage-gated uh, sodium channel are what determine whether it opens or not. That's why they call them voltage-gated, because the voltage around them determines whether they're going to open or close. And let me be a little bit more specific about that. Here is a close-up of one of these voltage-gated sodium channels. Here's the way it works. Here's its programming. If the area around a voltage-gated sodium channel is at a voltage of negative 55 millivolts or more positive, then the voltage-gated sodium channel opens up and lets sodium ions in. But if the voltage around it is negative 55 or more negative than negative 55, you know, negative 55 or, or, or lower, then the voltage-gated sodium ion channel is closed. Yeah, so whether it's open or closed depends on the voltage around it and the, the, the threshold voltage is negative 55 millivolts. And let me show you that same concept but on one of those voltmeter things. Um, so here's this, you know, voltmeter. Imagine this is measuring the voltage around the voltage-gated sodium ion channel. If that voltage is negative 55 or higher, 
or more positive than negative 55. Like negative 50 is more positive than um, negative 55, the, the channel would open. Or it could be negative 40, or negative 30, or negative 20, or 10, or 0, or 10, or 20, or positive 30. Anything that's more positive than negative 55, the voltage gated sodium ion channel opens. But if its environment is more negative than negative 55, then it's closed, like negative 58, negative 59, negative 60, negative 53, negative 67, negative 70. Anything more negative than negative 55, it's closed. So that's that's the programming of these voltage-gated uh, sodium ion channels. And so notice, yeah, the key voltage is negative 55, and that's sometimes called the threshold uh, voltage of the uh, voltage-gated uh, sodium channels. OK, so now you know um, how they work, you know, the programming of these voltage-gated sodium ion channels. And so the next question we're going to address is, well, is this one going to open? And so it all depends on whether there's enough electrical field, enough electrical charge that's gotten in this one zone to cause it to move to it to, to make it more positive than its threshold of negative 55 millivolts. So is, is that true? Is there enough positive charge electrical field here to make this one's environment negative 55 or more positive? And uh, the answer to that is yes. The, the voltage gated sodium ion channels in, an ax, in, a, in the axon are always spaced close enough so that when one voltage gated sodium ion channel lets in its sodiums, there's enough positive charge, there's enough positive electrical field to push the next one past its threshold. So this next one is going to open. Uh, so let's imagine that we had one of our little um, uh, voltmeters and we said, well, what is this one's environment in terms of its voltage? And let's just imagine that it's negative 50 millivolts. So is that going to open this voltage gated sodium ion channel? And the answer is yes, because that's more positive than negative 55. It's more positive than the threshold voltage of these voltage gated sodium ion channels. And so, oh yeah, here it just shows it again. You know, if we say that its environment was boosted to negative 50 instead of its, you know, normal environment of negative 7, if it moved it, if it, if it boosted it to negative 50, that's above the threshold, and so it will open up. And so that's what we're going to see here. This one opens up now and lets in its own group of sodium ions. And remember, whenever one of these opens up, whenever one of these sodium ion channels opens up, it always allows enough sodium ions in to change its environment to positive 30. And so now this one's going to have a field of, of electrical um, voltage of positive 30 millivolt right in that zone. Good. So notice that this voltage gated sodium ion channel caused this one to open by when this one let in its sodium ions, it caused this one's environment to be above the threshold voltage of negative 55. But now this one let in its own group of sodium ions. And so let's do a review question. What's this one's uh, voltage right beneath the sodium ion channel that just opened? And you're correct, positive 30, because whenever one of these ones opens, it always lets in enough sodium ions to change its environment right there to positive 30. We say that it's depolarized in that spot. Will this one open? Well, the answer is yes, because remember, whenever one of these, or this is like the third uh, voltage-gated sodium ion channel along the axon. But yeah, whenever one of these lets in, uh, opens and lets in sodium ions, there's enough positive charge to trigger the next one past its um, threshold. And so if we again took our little voltmeter and said, well, exactly how positive did this one get? Well, it got to negative 50 millivolts, but that's more positive than the negative 55 threshold. And so now this one will open up, right? Negative 50 is more positive than negative 55. And so now this one will open up. And so it happened again, you know. Now this one's letting in its sodium ions made enough positive charge to push this one, this third one, past its threshold. And now let it let in a bunch of sodium ions to change its environment uh, from negative uh, for, to uh, to positive 30. Yeah, so now that's where the positive 30 is, and so that one has enough uh, let in enough positive charge to push this fourth um, voltage gated sodium ion channel past its threshold, and so now you know, there's positive 30 there, and this one made this one go more positive than negative 55. So this one has been pushed past its threshold. And now it opens up and lets uh, sodium ions in. So I think you can see the pattern here. Each one, each voltage gated sodium ion channels, when it opens, lets in enough positive charges, enough sodium ions to 
push the next one past its threshold. So the next one opens and lets in enough sodium to push the next one past its threshold. So the next one opens and lets in sodium to push the next one past its threshold. So it's kind of a, a chain reaction. And it, I describe this in your lecture outlines. The so voltage-gated sodium ion channels are spaced closely enough uh, apart from each other so that when one voltage-gated sodium ion channel opens, it creates enough positive charge to open the next uh, voltage-gated sodium ion channel, which then creates enough positive charge to open the next voltage-gated uh, sodium ion channel. So yeah, it, it's kind of a, a, a chain reaction um, as the 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 as the, as you go down the axon, each one changing its own zone into positive 30 millivolts, and that's enough to make the next one go more positive than its threshold negative 55. So the next one uh, opens up. Yeah, so there's the next one right there. So here is now kind of a zoomed out view of the neuron. So remember. In this right now the neuron is at rest and so uh, when just as a review question when neurons are at rest what's their voltage inside uh, well it's negative but it's negative 70 all throughout the neuron when it's at rest and now let's uh, add the um, sodium ion uh, remember that sodium ions are uh, there's a concentration gradient they are uh, such that there's a high concentration of sodium ions outside and a much lower concentration of sodium ions inside and also remember that all along the axon are these voltage-gated sodium ion channels. Okay, and yes, yeah, so um, when the first voltage-gated sodium ion channel on the axon opens up, it lets in enough sodium ions to make a positive 30 millivolt charge right there. And yeah, that gets less positive as you move further away, but it's always enough to trigger the next voltage-gated sodium ion channel to go past its threshold. So now that one opens up. And so now this is where the positive 30 charge is right there. And so that is enough positive charge to push the, push the next one past its threshold. And so it opens up and lets in sodium ions to positive 30. And so now the zone of positive 30 is right there. And that one trips the next one to go. And so now the zone of positive 30 is right there. And that one makes the next one go. Which, so now the zone of positive 30 is right there. And so you can see it's a, yeah, it's a total chain reaction. Each voltage-gated sodium ion channel lets in enough sodium ions to trigger the next one along the axon. And so you get this, this, this chain reaction of one after another opening up. And so the zone of positive 30 works its way along the axon. Um, now, uh, some people describe this as the domino effect. Maybe you've done this game with dominoes where you stack up a bunch of dominoes straight up next to each other, and all you got to do is tip the first one, and so then it starts a chain reaction. That one knocks over the second one, then the second one knocks over the third one, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so all we have to do is open up this first voltage-gated sodium ion channel, and then the uh, zone of positive 30 will work its way automatically all the way down, uh, all the, way down the axon. All right, so uh, remember that what we're doing is we're talking about the nature of the ax action potential that goes down the axon, and I've just been showing it as this spark, right? Well, now we know a little bit more what it is. When I show that spark moving down the axon, that spark is the zone of positive 30 millivolts. The neuron as a whole rests at negative 70, but when I show the spark, that's the positive 30 zone moving down the axon, so that the spark the, the positive 30 zone moving down the axon is the action potential. Matter of fact, that was so much fun. Let's watch it again. That first voltage-gated sodium ion channel opens up. And so the action potential is right there. And then that triggers the next voltage-gated sodium ion channel to open up. So now the action potential, you know, the positive 30 zone is right there. And so that one triggers the next one. So now the action potential, the positive 30 millivolt zone is right there. And well, you get the idea. The action potential moving down the axon is the positive millivolt zone moving down the axon and it does it moves down the axon because um, it's it's a chain reaction of voltage gated sodium ion channels uh, each triggering the next one to open up all along the axon it's beautiful now I don't think I have it in this cartoon but just as a review question when the action potential reaches the axon terminal there at the end, what happens in the axon terminal? And if your guess was that it 
the axon terminal secretes neurotransmitters, uh, that would be the correct answer. Oh, I guess I do have it. There they go right there. Okay, so a lot of what I just described is in the lecture handout in the section on voltage-gated ion channels, oh, sorry, voltage-gated sodium channels. But in the lecture handout, if you go back to the part that talks about action potentials, there's a part in the middle of that action potential uh, part of the handout that describes what we just saw. And so let me read through that. Uh, that part uh, says that the action potential is a change in the axon voltage from the negative 70 millivolts to the uh, positive 30 millivolts. Maybe I can just run this backwards a little bit. Go backwards, go backwards. There we go. Yeah, so uh, reading from the lecture outline, the action potential is a change in the axon's voltage from negative 70 millivolts to positive 30 millivolts, and the change in voltage is caused by the voltage-gated sodium ion channels all along the axon, which let in sodium ions. Uh, and when that's happening, we say that uh, th that that zone is the depolarized zone. So the depolarized zone, the positive 30 millivolt zone, moves down the axon. OK, well. Um, we're not quite done with discussing how action potentials work yet, uh, but I want to go on a slight tangent for a moment and talk about sort of an interesting um, medical concept that relates to this. Um, you've heard of local anesthetics. Local anesthetics are where they numb a part of the body, just one part of the body, so that they can do surgery on it without putting the person in pain. And a classical example of this is where the dentist gives you uh, Novocaine, or sometimes it's called Lidocaine, uh, which is a local anesthetic. And yeah, so it, it numbs your mouth so you don't feel any pain while the dentist is, is, is doing their surgery. Well, those local anesthetics work by blocking the sodium ion channels of pain receptor neurons. Isn't that kind of fascinating? Yeah, so local anesthetics like Novocaine and Lidocaine, they stop the voltage-gated ion channels in the pain receptor neurons from firing, and so you're pain-free. You know, if these uh, pain receptor uh, neurons can't have an action potential, they can't signal any pain, and so whoop de doo you can have a pain-free surgery thanks to these uh, voltage gate thanks to these local anesthetics of uh, blocking the voltage gated ion channels isn't that kind of kind of neat okay so i think you understand the importance of these voltage gated sodium channels uh for the for the purposes of the action potential uh moving down the axon but they are not the full story of how the action potential works in the axon there's a second protein called a voltage voltage gated potassium channel uh, that is also involved in the process. Now, let me first explain the reason that the axon needs these voltage-gated potassium channels in addition to these volt voltage-gated uh, sodium channels. All right, so um, as you've been seeing, yeah, these voltage-gated sodium ion channels open up, and they allow the sodium ions to come in, and that zone of the axon uh, becomes depolarized. It gets a positive 30 millivolt charge, right? Okay, now notice how important it is for each of those voltage-gated sodium channels to shut after it starts letting sodium ions in. Maybe I can emphasize that by what would happen if it didn't shut? What if it happened if it happened if it just stayed open? Well, remember there's a large concentration of sodium ions outside and a much smaller concentration of sodium ions inside, and so those sodium ions want to go inside the neuron. All solutes want to move down their concentration gradient. So if one of these voltage-gated sodium channels did not shut, what would happen is those sodium ions would just keep coming in and coming in and coming in, right? And so what would happen to the, and they're positively charged, right? So what would happen to the negative charge inside the entire neuron, well, it would eventually go away, right? Because more sodium ions would come in and neutralize all that negative charge and eventually, yeah, the whole neuron would no longer be negative charged the way it was supposed to be, and the neuron just couldn't function properly. It couldn't function correctly if it lost its its negative charge inside. So what I'm saying is the, the neuron has to have some way of shutting these voltage-gated sodium channels after the voltage-sodium-gated channel has let in the proper number of 
of sodium ions. Okay, so how what shuts these voltage-gated sodium ion channels? Well, we talked about that. It's the voltage surrounding them, right? If the voltage around one of these voltage-gated sodium channels is negative 55 or more positive, uh, then it's open. And if the voltage around one of these voltage-gated sodium ion channels is more negative than 55 millivolts, then it shuts, right? So what I'm saying is, for the neuron to shut the sodium ion channel, it has to make the voltage in its area negative 55 millivolts or more negative, right? That's what shuts them. And to show that in terms of one of these voltmeters right here, remember after the voltage-gated sodium channel has let in the sodium ions, um, well, you tell me, what's the um, electrical charge right at the, right at the bottom of the sodium channel? It's positive 30, right? Okay, so it, the neuron needs to get that channel to shut after it's let in the positive 30 millivolts of sodium ions. And the only way to do that is to make the voltage in this area negative, you know, somewhere below the negative 55 threshold. Yeah, so what the neuron has to do is lower the voltage uh, around this voltage-gated sodium ion channel so that it goes below the threshold of negative 55, and that will shut the sodium ion channel, which is what the, what the neuron needs. Okay, yeah, as you can, you can see there, that's what the neuron is trying to accomplish, is shutting these voltage-gated uh, sodium ion channels. Okay, now, um, you might say, okay, so uh, how is it going to do that? How is it going to get rid of the positive charge in the, in the vicinity of this sodium channel so that the sodium channel will shut? Well, let's... Uh, Oh yeah, so it's it's positive 30. And yeah, it needs to, to shut that. It needs to get it below negative 55 millivolts. So how's it going to do that? Well, here's a close-up. Um, remember that the neuron can make negative charge inside by kicking out positive charges. And so what the neuron is going to do is kick positive charges out in this region to get the neuron to get more negative in this region. And that's, it's going to shut the uh, sodium ion channel. Yeah, so that so the, the again, what the neuron has to do is make this area more negative, more negative than negative 55 millivolts, because that will shut the sodium ion channel, which is what the neuron needs to happen. So you might think at first, well, why doesn't the neuron just kick out these sodium ions? But it turns out that's not what the neuron does. The neuron actually is going to kick out potassium ions. And if you think about it, that would work just as well, right? Because potassium ions have the same charge of sodium ions. So the neuron can kick out positive charges by kicking out potassium ions. It, they don't, you know, it doesn't have to kick out sodium ions. And so, yeah, that, that's what the neuron is going to do. Now, you might wonder, well, why doesn't the neuron kick out sodium ions to make this area more negative again? Um, you know, why kick out potassium ions? Well, remember that the potassium ions are at a high concentration inside the neuron and at a low concentration outside the neuron. So the potassium ions naturally want to leave the neuron. And so that's why it's just easier for the, uh, for the neuron to get rid of positive charge by kicking out the potassium ions. They, the potassium ions want to leave the neuron uh, by going down their concentration gradient. Okay, yeah, so that's the basic idea here. There, there is a... Um, there's a channel protein in the um, in the neuron um, membrane right next to the sodium ion channel, but this is a voltage-gated potassium ch channel. So when this one opens up, it lets potassium ions out of the neuron. And just one more time, the, the goal of that is to make this area negative so that this voltage-gated sodium channel will shut. And so I think when I click the button, we're going to see that uh, happen. Oh, and let me first give the definition of it. So if you look in your lecture handout, uh, it defines the voltage-gated potassium channels as channel proteins in the axon membrane that, when they're open, allow potassium ions to flow out uh, of the axon. All right, so let's watch it happen. The voltage-gated potassium channel opens up, and it lets out enough potassium ions to restore this area of the of the axon to its resting potential of negative 70 millivolts. So yeah, every time one of those potassium channels opens up, uh, it lets out enough potassium ions to get rid of positive charge enough to restore this to the proper resting potential of negative 70 uh, millivolts. And of course, that shuts the uh, 
that shuts the sodium ion channel, right? The sodium ion channel will shut at any voltage below negative 55 millivolts, and certainly bringing this area back down to negative 70 is an, enough to, uh, to shut it. Okay, um, now here's the thing, that there are these potassium ion channels all along the entire axon. Uh, essentially, you, you, there, there's one potassium ion channel right next to every sodium ion channel. And so the beauty of that is that every time a sodium ion channel um, opens up and lets in positive charge, you know, to depolarize the neuron in that zone and make it negative 70 millivolts, as soon as that happens, there's a potassium ion channel to let out potassium ions to restore that area to the negative, uh, the resting potential of negative 70 millivolts. So let's watch that. Here's the first uh, voltage-gated sodium ion channel. It does what it's supposed to do. It opens up and lets in sodium ions to make that area positive 30 millivolts. And then as soon as that happens, the voltage-gated potassium channel lets out potassium ions to restore this area to its negative 70 resting potential. But remember, that so voltage-gated sodium ion channel has triggered the next voltage-gated sodium ion channel to open, and so that area now became positive 30. But as soon as that happens, the voltage-gated potassium channel right next to it opens up and lets out potassium ions to restore this to its uh, negative 70 resting potential, just as this next sodium ion channel opens, and the process just repeats itself on down the axon. So you know, marvelous. Look at this. And, and you could see the positive 30 millivolt action potential is still moving down the axon, but thanks to these voltage-gated potassium channels right behind it, the axon gets restored to the negative 70 uh, resting potential the way it's supposed to. So working together, the voltage-gated sodium ion channels and the voltage-gated potassium ion channels ensure that the positive 30 action potential moves all the way down the axon, but behind it, it the, the neuron is restored to the negative 70 resting potential uh, that it's supposed to have. All right, so um, this part of the uh, lecture handout was covered in the part that talks about voltage-gated potassium channels, but if you go back in the lecture handout to the part that talks about the action potential, there's a uh, part of that that also describes what we just saw here, that uh, after an action potential has passed through a region of the axon, that axon uh, returns to negative 70 millivolts, uh, thanks to those voltage-gated potassium channels opening up. And matter of fact, let me see if I can run that backwards. There we go, yeah. Uh, so uh, reading now from the um, web handout, um, after uh, an action potential has passed through a region of the axon, that region returns to negative 70 millivolts, like what we're seeing right here. Uh, sorry, what we're going to see right there thanks to the potassium ion channels. Um, the potassium ion channels change the voltage in that area back down to the resting potential of negative 70 millivolts. And when that happens, we say that the, um, that the potassium ion channels have repolarized the uh, neuron, meaning restored it to the negative 70 millivolt uh, resting potential. there it is. And of course, when it reaches the axon terminal, the neurotransmitters get released. Well, let's uh, one more time have a close-up on the uh, voltage-gated sodium channel and also the voltage-gated potassium channel that's right next to it. So when the neuron is not carrying any action potentials, the whole interior, the whole cytoplasm of the neuron is at its resting potential, its resting voltage of negative 70 millivolts, um, including right under the, uh, you know, the area right underneath the voltage-gated sodium channel. Um, but remember, when the action potential moves through this region of the axon, what that means is that the voltage-gated sodium channel opens up. Oh, sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. So the, when we say that the uh, neuron is, is, is at negative 70 millivolts, we say that the neuron is polarized. So this, this region right here is polarized. Uh, but what I was about to say is when the action potential comes through this region of the axon, what that means is the voltage-gated sodium channel opens up and it lets um, enough sodium ions in to change this region to a positive 30 
uh, millivolts. And we say that this region has now become depolarized. Well, let me stop the action here for a second and show you um, what we just saw, you know, going from polarized to depolarized um, a little bit more closely in terms of one of these uh, voltmeters. And so, well, you tell me. So when the neuron was resting before that voltage-gated sodium ion channel opened up, what was the voltage in that region of the axon? It was negative 70, right? And we say that the, the neuron was polarized at that point in that region. All right, and then when the voltage-gated sodium ion channel opened up, that made the, the neuron in that region more positive, right, from those sodium ions coming in. And so the voltage uh, goes up in the vicinity of that uh, voltage-gated sodium channel, and it goes all the way up to 30, uh, positive 30 millivolts. And that stage right there, we say that that region of the, of, the, of the axon is depolarizing, you know, as the sodium ions are coming in. So notice if we make sort of a, a curve, a graph out of the voltage change, it started at negative 70, and then it slopes upward to positive 30, and that upward slope of the graph is called the depolarizing of that region of the axon, and it, it's caused by the sodium ions coming into the axon through the voltage-gated sodium channel. Good? All right. Um, yeah, and then when it reaches positive 30, that area of the axon has become depolarized. Okay, so getting back to our view here, so it got depolarized. And remember that when the area has become depolarized, it's a positive 30 millivolts. Now it's the voltage-gated potassium channel, channel's time to get in, to kick into gear. What it does is it opens up when this region has become positive uh, 30 millivolts, and it lets out potassium ions, and it lets them out until this region uh, has gone back to the negative 70 millivolts, and we say that that region of the axon is repolarizing. So here is it repolarizing, and um, so yeah, eventually it restores it to its to its resting potential of negative 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 70 and it yeah it is now repolarized so now let's look at look at that on our um, graph so to speak uh, so the uh, the that region of the neuron of the axon had depolarized because of the sodium ions entering that region through the voltage gated sodium channel but now the potassium uh, the voltage gated potassium channel opens up letting out potassium uh, ions, and so that's going to make the that region of the axon more negative, like this. And so we say that region of the axon is now repolarizing; it's getting more negative, and uh, the voltage-gated potassium ch channel keeps letting out potassium ions until that region of the axon is fully restored to the negative 70 uh, millivolts. And now we say that it has repolarized; that region has become repolarized. Good. Uh, so here's the full graph right there, and again, uh, the upslope of it is called the depolarizing part of 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 the of the cycle, and that's for the sodium ions entering the axon through the voltage-gated sodium channel, and then right now we at this point we say that the that region has depolarized. And then there's the repolarizing part, which is caused by the voltage-gated potassium channel letting potassium ions out of the axon. That's the repolarizing part. And when it comes back down to negative 70 millivolts, that region has now been repolarized. Now, once an axon has started to have one of these action potentials, it has to go through the full thing. In other words, once the first voltage-gated sodium ion channel opens up, then you're going to get everything we talked about. The, the, the action potential will move all the way down the axon. There's no stopping it. And while the axon is having a, an action potential running down it, the neuron is not able to have any more action potentials. It's only, it's only one action potential at a time. And so the, the, the neuron is essentially not open to getting any more action potentials running through it while one action potential is running through it. And so the neurologists use the term refractory period for the um, 
for the for the neuron. A neuron that's having an, an action potential is in its refractory period, meaning that it's not going to have any more action potentials until it's completed the action potential that it started. And so yeah, what you see here, this upward, moving upward of the neuron's voltage and then going back down to the um, resting potential, negative 70 volts, volts, that's that while it's doing that, it's in its refractory period, and it's not going to accept any more um, any more action potentials until it, it, it finishes the one that, that, that it started. Whew. All right, so you are now very much an expert on exactly what this sparkling electric um, uh, nerve signal that I've been showing going through the axon is. It's the action potential, and... Well, you know the full story. It involves sodium ions rushing into the axon through voltage-gated sodium channels, but it also involves um, potassium ions exiting the axon through voltage-gated potassium ch channels. Okay, so uh, yeah, don't forget any of those concepts that we talked about, about how the action potential works and the role of the uh, voltage-gated sodium ion channels and the role of the voltage-gated uh, potassium ion channels. Uh, we're going to come back to those. We're going to move to a slightly different concept now, but we're going to come back to those concepts that we just learned about how the action potential in the axon works. So yeah, don't forget them. And in particular, uh, please keep in mind that to have the action potential in the axon, what has to happen is that first voltage-gated sodium ion channel has to open. You remember, because when that happens, it starts a chain reaction that allows the whole axon to have the action potential, right? Okay, so like I say, don't forget those concepts. We're going to come back to them in just a moment. But for right now, we're going to talk about uh, a different concept that we talked about earlier. So I've showed you this diagram before. Um, I told you that oftentimes neurons occur in series. And what I mean by that is where one neur neuron's like this and the uh, axon terminal of one neuron is right next to the dendrites of the next neuron. And the the reason neurons are arranged in a series, in a chain like this, is that allows one neuron's nerve signal to be passed to the next neuron. And a little bit more details about this. Remember that the junction between um, one neuron and the next neuron is called the synapse. The synapse includes the axon terminal of what they call the presynaptic neuron. And uh, the synapse also includes the dendrites of what they call the postsynaptic neuron. And the synapse also includes the synaptic cleft, the little gap between the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron and the dendrites of the postsynaptic neuron. And also remember that the, uh, the action potential uh, can't cross the synaptic cleft. And so what actually crosses the synaptic cleft are molecules called neurotransmitters. And uh, these neurotransmitters, they get secreted by the, um, the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron and then the dendrites of the postsynaptic synaptic neuron have uh, receptors for those neurotransmitters. And I told you when the receptors bind the neurotransmitter, that's what causes the postsynaptic neuron to have its own action potential. Okay, so hopefully all of that sounds um, kind of familiar to you. Let's see a little bit of it in action here. Here's the presynaptic neuron having its action potential. And then when it arrives at the axon terminal, that causes the presynaptic neuron to secrete neurotransmitters into the synapse. Well, there are actually two major types of neurotransmitters. One type of neurotransmitter is called excitatory neurotransmitters, and those are neurotransmitters that promote an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. In other words, excitatory uh, neurotransmitters, they try to get the postsynaptic neuron to have an action potential. But there are also inhibitory neurotransmitters. Inhibitory neurotransmitters are one that inhibit the an, an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. In other words, inhibitory neurotransmitters try to stop the postsynaptic neuron from having an action potential. All right, so we're going to talk about these two types of neurotransmitters, excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters. We're going to talk about them one at a time, starting with uh, excitatory neurotransmitters. So, so yeah, let's say that these are excitatory neurotransmitters. So yes, their goal is to cause an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. So when they bind to those neurotransmitter receptors, 
it causes an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, well, um, let's zoom in on the synapse, and we're going to learn a little bit more about exactly how those excitatory neurotransmitters cause an action potential in the in the postsynaptic neuron. All right, so yeah, so here's a close up of the um, uh, of the synapse. Here is the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron. Here are the dendrites of the postsynaptic neuron, and I also put you know, the first voltage-gated sodium ion channel um, along the axon right there. And, oh yeah, there's the um, first voltage-gated potassium channel, but um, in the discussion we're having right now, the voltage-gated sodium ion channel is the more important one. Okay, so let's see a few things. Here are the excitatory neurotransmitters um, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron. Here are the receptors for those excitatory uh, neurotransmitters in the dendrites of the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, so um, remember what we talked about a few minutes ago. Uh, the goal of these excitatory neurotransmitters is to have this neuron have its own action potential. And for this neuron to have its own action potential, what has to happen is that first voltage-gated sodium ion channel has to open, right? Because once that opens, it'll start that chain reaction uh, and you'll get the action potential going down the axon. So the, uh, the key to this postsynaptic neuron having its own action potential is to get that voltage-gated sodium, voltage sodium ion channel right there at the beginning of the axon to open up, right? Um, and remember what makes it open up. Uh, these voltage-gated sodium ion channels open when the voltage in their region is negative 55 millivolts or higher. Now, of course, it's not open right now because remember when neurons are at rest, their voltage inside is negative 70 millivolts. And so, you know, that's more negative than negative 55. So this one is not at its threshold and that's why it's closed. Oh, okay, so what I'm saying is these excitatory neurotransmitters working with the receptors for those excitatory uh, uh, neurotransmitters working together their goal is to make this region of the neuron where the first voltage gated sodium ion channel to make that region negative 55 millivolts or higher because that will open that uh, first voltage gated sodium ion channel and that will cause the um, uh, cause the action potential okay so here we see those excitatory neurotransmitters being released into the synaptic cleft um, they diffuse around, and let's say let's say one of them uh, binds right here to this um, receptor for that excitatory um, neurotransmitter. All right, so let's talk about the receptors for those excitatory neurotransmitters. In your um, web handout, it says this about them: the receptors for the excitatory neurotransmitters are chemical gated sodium ion channels. Now. Uh, for the moment, don't worry about chemical gated. Focus on this part. They are sodium ion channels. Um, and so remember what those are. Uh, that's just a, a channel membrane that will allow sodium ions into the, into the neuron. But, you know, these proteins we're talking about, they're also receptors. And so this is the first time we've in, encountered sort of a, a double-purposed membrane protein. So this protein we're looking at right here is a receptor for those neurotransmitters, but it's also simultaneously a channel protein for sodium ions. Kind of cool, you know, it's a membrane protein that does double duty. It's a receptor and it's a channel protein. Okay, and so um, the way these um, neurotransmitter receptors work is this. Um, the ion channel, the sodium ion channel of the receptor is closed when there's no neurotransmitter being bound by the receptor. But when the receptor is binding a neurotransmitter, that causes the receptor to open up its sodium ion channel. So, yeah, if one of these excitatory neurotransmitters gets bound by the receptor, the receptor then opens up its sodium ion channel, and then that starts to allow sodium ions uh, into, into the neuron, right? Okay, so, yeah, just grasp that, that this is the, the programming of these receptors for the excitatory neurotransmitters. They are a receptor 
for the neurotransmitter, but they are also um, a, a channel for uh, sodium ions. And that's why they call them chemical-gated. Uh, what they mean by chemical, they mean a molecule, like the, um, in this case, the excitatory neurotransmitter, because it's the presence or absence of the excitatory neurotransmitter molecule that opens or closes the gate, opens or closes the, uh, the sodium ion channel. All right, so um, getting back to this scene right here, we've seen right here, we saw that this um, receptor for the neurotransmitter has bound the neurotransmitter. And so remember what, what that happens, what that means is its sodium ion channel opens up. And so it starts to allow sodium ions to enter the, um, enter the, the postsynaptic neuron right there. And remember, I use this kind of glowing yellow color to represent uh, areas of positive electrical charge because you know when the sodium ions come in that creates positive electrical charge inside the uh, inside the neuron okay so my question is will there be enough positive electrical charge let in oh actually sorry i got a little ahead of myself this um this region of positive electrical charge that has come inside the neuron because of those sodium ions coming in uh through the chemical gated sodium channel uh, we call that that region of positive charge an epsp it stands for excitatory postsynaptic potential in other words it's a potential means voltage so it's a it's an area of higher voltage more positive voltage inside the uh, postsynaptic neuron and it again it, it came in there because this receptor opened up a sodium ion channel which lets in positive charge Okay, so uh, my question is, is there enough positive charge from this uh, excitatory postsynaptic potential? Is there enough positive charge to open up this first voltage-gated sodium channel so that the neuron can have a, an action potential? Well, it all depends, because remember, what will open this up is if this is area right here next to the uh, voltage-gated sodium channel is negative 55 millivolts or higher. And so let's say we had our little voltmeter thing here. Oh yeah, so that's just re reminding you that for these voltage-gated sodium uh, channels that their threshold is negative 55. So when the neuron is resting at negative 70 millivolts, they're closed. But if we can boost them above negative 55 or, or more positive, then they open up. So yeah, so I'm saying is whether or not this EPSP had enough positive charge to open this voltage-gated sodium ion channel and, and to make an action potential all depends on whether enough positive charge came in to make this area right here next to the voltage-gated sodium ion channel negative 55 or higher. Well, let's say we had our little microscopic voltmeter and we stuck it in there like that and we found out there's a voltage of negative 63 millivolts here. Um, so is that enough? to open up the voltage-gated sodium ion channel. What do you think? And the answer in this case would be no, it's not quite enough positive charge to do it because, you know, negative 63 millivolts is not above the negative 55 threshold for these voltage-gated sodium ion channels, so it's not enough to open it. Uh, so, you know, notice that the sodium ions that came in through the chemical-gated um, um, sodium ion channel, you know, the receptor, they did have an effect because remember the neuron, most of the regions of the neuron is negative 70 millivolts. So it, it did bring in some positive charge, but not enough positive charge to open this first voltage gated sodium channel. So this neuron, neuron at this point is not going to have an action potential because we, you know, to have the action potential, we need to open up that first voltage gated sodium ion channel, right? Okay. So, it, you know, it, it didn't work apparently with the, the neuron did not have an action potential. Well, let's go back in time for a moment. Uh, so this is, um, you know, before the presynaptic neuron released its neurotransmitters. Let's in, imagine now that this presynaptic neuron is going to release even more of those excitatory neurotransmitters. Here they go. And so since more of them are being secreted into the synaptic cleft, let's say two of these excitatory neurotransmitters bind to uh, the receptors there on the postsynaptic neuron. And so now two um, receptors will open up their uh, chemical gated sodium ion channels. So we'll have even more positive charge going into the postsynaptic neuron, right? 
And so, yeah, there's, there's going to be an even bigger boost of positive charge here. And you think, well, will that be enough to open up this uh, voltage-gated sodium ion channel so the neuron can have an action potential? Well, again, it all depends on how much positive charge uh, gets into this region right here. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, I got ahead of myself here. So we would now say that this neuron has two of these excitatory postsynaptic potentials, one from this receptor and one from this receptor right here. So, uh, you know, are these two uh, uh, EPSPs enough to boost this past its threshold of negative 55 so we can have the action potential? Well, I'll answer that question in just a second, but what I want to point out here is something that's in your handout about this. The more of these EPSPs, um, the more of the neurotransmitters there are in the synapse, the more EPSPs you'll have inside the postsynaptic neuron, and the total amount of positive charge that comes in the, into the this neuron is the sum total of all the EPSPs. So you, you add together all the EPSPs, you add together all the positive charge that's let in to find out what the total amount of positive charge is. And that total amount of positive charge is going to determine whether this first voltage-gated sodium ion channel of the axon opens or not, and so whether the neuron has an action potential or not. So my question is, well, were these two EPSPs enough to open this first voltage-gated sodium ion channel. Well, let's get out our little voltmeter, and let's say I tell you that together these two EPSPs added to negative 59 millivolts in this region. So what do you think? Will that be enough for it to open up the um, voltage-gated sodium ion channel? And the answer in this case, again, would be no, because negative 59 millivolts is not past the threshold of the voltage-gated sodium ion channel. So again, uh, it's not enough to open it up. So no action potential yet. Well, let's go back in time yet again. Here we go. And let's say that the presynaptic neuron is going to release even more neurotransmitters um, into the synapse. Here they go. And let's say enough of those neurotransmitters were let in so that now three excitatory um, neurotransmitters bind to the receptors, one, two, three. So now we're going to have even more sodium ions rushing into the postsynaptic neuron. So we're, in this case, we're going to have three of these uh, EPSPs, uh, uh, three of these excitatory postsynaptic potentials. And so remember that we add them all together, so we're going to have even more positive charge. And so my question is, well, will that be enough to push this first um, voltage-gated sodium ion channel past its threshold to open it up? Well, we'll bust out our voltmeter again and uh, so now it tells us that in this region, these three P EPSPs were enough to make this region right here negative 51 millivolts. Is that enough to open this uh, voltage-gated sodium ion channel? And the answer is yes, right? Because negative uh, 51 millivolts is above. It's more positive than the negative 55 millivolt threshold. So it is going to open up like you see there. And remember, that's the key to having the action potential. When the first one opens up, it triggers the second one to open up, and that triggers the third uh, voltage-gated sodium ion channel to open up, and that triggers the fourth, and yada, yada, yada. And so the, the takeaway lesson here is that the more neurotransmitters, the more of these excitatory neurotransmitters get released into the synapse, the more EPSPs, the postsynaptic uh, neuron is going is going to have those are the excitatory postsynaptic potentials which really means you know the amount of positive charge that's let in and if enough of these epsps come in that raises the voltage in the vicinity of this first voltage gated sodium ion channels if enough of it comes in it raises it past the threshold of negative 55 and once that happens it triggers the action potential uh, in the in the neuron now in my example here I said that when it had three of these EPSPs, that was enough. That I was just making it up. Um, I don't exactly know how many of these EPSPs it actually takes for a real neuron to trigger its action potential. Uh, and it probably varies from one neuron to another. Uh, so yeah, the point I'm making is not that it takes always takes three of these EPSPs, you know, three neurotransmitters binding. Uh, the point is that you add up all the EPSPs and However many there are, if it's enough to make 
the region around this first voltage gated sodium ion channel negative 55 or higher, then you'll get an action potential because then it will open and that will open the second one and that will open the third one and that will open the fourth one, etc, etc. And, and that is the action potential. Okay, now in a moment we're going to talk about the opposite kind of neurotransmitter, the uh, inhibitory neurotransmitters. But before I do, let me give you one quick review concept. Remember that the uh, synapse needs to get rid of these neurotransmitters as quickly as possible. You know, after those neurotransmitters have come across and bound to the receptors on the postsynaptic neuron, uh, the synapse needs to get rid of these as rapidly as possible. Why? Because it doesn't want them stuck there. If the uh, excitatory neurotransmitters just were stuck in those receptors, more and more sodium ions would keep flooding in, and that would eventually, um, you know, make this neuron just get stuck in, in a signaling uh, state. Um, and so, yeah, it needs to get rid of these uh, excitatory neurotransmitters as rapidly as possible. And remember how that happens. There's a couple different ways. The uh, postsynaptic neuron and the presynaptic neuron uh, both secrete enzymes that destroy the neurotransmitters like you see there um, and of course that shuts this, the sodium channels when those receptors get rid of their um, uh, their excitatory neurotransmitter but also remember that the presynaptic neuron can do something called reuptake which is where it uses endocytosis to take back in uh, those neurotransmitters Okay, yeah, so that was just a reminder that the synapse gets rid of the neurotransmitters that are in the synapse as quickly as possible, essentially to allow this postsynaptic neuron to uh, reset itself. Okay, that was a quick review of how the synapse clears out the neurotransmitters. Um, let's return to this picture here. So um, one of the reasons I'm showing this diagram here is just to remind you that oftentimes neurons are arranged in a, in a series of neurons like you see here. In other words, a chain of neurons. And the idea is that this allows each neuron to pass the nerve signal onto the next neuron. For instance, this one right here has its action potential, and then by using these excitatory neurotransmitters, it causes the next neuron to have an action potential, and then when that re one releases its excitatory neurotransmitters, that causes the next neuron to have its action potential and on down the line, and that's how nerve signals uh, get passed around, one neuron passing the nerve signal onto the, uh, onto the next neuron. So, you know, these neurotransmitters that you see being illustrated here are excitatory neuro neurotransmitters because they're, they're promoting a, an action potential in, in, in the neuron that, uh, that receives them. But I think I mentioned earlier that there is a such thing as inhibitory neurotransmitters. Inhibitory neurotransmitters are one that try to prevent a neuron from having an action potential. And the, the neurons that secrete these inhibitory neurotransmitters we can call inhibitory neurons. Um, so you might wonder, well, why would the nervous system want to prevent a neuron from having an action potential? You know, aren't those neurons supposed to have the action potential? Well, there are times when it's appropriate for a neuron not to have an action potential. And so there are times when it's best to inhibit that neuron from having an action potential. And so that's when these inhibitory neurotransmitters uh, from these inhibitory neurons are, are appropriate. And just to give one example of this, um, you might have heard stories where, or maybe you've experienced this yourself, where someone has a traumatic injury, perhaps in a car crash, but they don't feel any pain for a few minutes afterwards. Like maybe they broke their arm or broke a leg or something, but they're so pumped up full of adrenaline after the accident that they can just walk around and they don't feel a thing. And then, you know, maybe after they've calmed down a little bit, then they start to notice that, that they've hurt themselves. Well, what they think is going on there is that when, you're, when your brain senses that you're in a, in a crisis, your brain temporarily inhibits the pain sensing neurons to allow you to deal with the crisis before you get overcome uh, by the pain. So I'm just using this as an example of, of in some cases when it's appropriate for the, um, uh, the nervous system to try to inhibit a neuron, like a pain sensing neuron, from, um, uh, from having an action potential. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is, is um, we're going to look more closely at the this synapse right here to see how the inhibitory neurotransmitters uh, work and how they they integrate, so to speak, with the excitatory neurotransmitters. So yeah, let's zoom in there on that synapse. And, and you know, the synapse 
now has uh, one axon terminal that's releasing excitatory neurotransmitters, and it also has an axon terminal uh, that's going to be releasing some inhibitory neurotransmitters. Okay, so here's the synapse right here. Here's the axon terminal with these excitatory neurotransmitters. Here are the receptors for those excitatory neurotransmitters in the postsynaptic neuron cell. Um, here's the uh, voltage-gated sodium ion channel at the beginning of the axon of that postsynaptic neuron. And this right here is the axon terminal of the inhibitory um, uh, um, neuron. Uh, now, so before we start talking about the actions of the inhibitory neurotransmitters, let me first review the excitatory ones. I, I know we talked about these just a few minutes ago, but let's do a quick review. So when the neuron that releases the excitatory neurotransmitters has an action potential, like that, it releases those excitatory neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. They diffuse around. Um, some of them bind to those um, chemical-gated sodium ion channels, those neurotransmitter receptors, and that allows sodium ions to flood into the neuron, making it, uh, you know, making, giving it a, what they call an excitatory postsynaptic potential, you know, a region of positive charge inside the neuron. And remember the way it works. You add up the combined voltage of all the EPSPs that are created by these excitatory neurotransmitters, and if their combined voltage is positive enough to make this first voltage-gated sodium ion channel of the axon negative 55 or more positive, then you get an action potential because then this one opens up and lets sodium ions in, and then that opens up the next one, and that opens up the next one, and the whole axon has its action potential. And so, um, yeah, let's imagine that we're going to take a millivolt reading right here where that first voltage-gated sodium ion channel is, and we're going to see if these three EPSPs have enough positive charge to uh, push this one past its threshold and open it up. So we get out our old volt me voltmeter, and we test right there, and that region has a voltage of negative 51 millivolts. So what do you think? Is that going to open up that voltage-gated sodium ion channel? The answer is yes, because that's more positive than the negative 55 millivolt threshold. All right, so, oh, so yeah, so it's, anyway, that one would open up and have, um, and so you'd have an action potential. Okay, so um, just kind of remember that, that in this example we're talking about, there are enough excitatory postsynaptic potentials, there are enough uh, EPSPs to open up the first voltage-gated sodium ion channel of the axon, and so there's enough to have the action potential if there were no um, inhibitory neurotransmitters. But now we're going to see how the inhibitory neurotransmitters have the potential of stopping this neuron from having um, uh, an action potential. Okay, so there are the inhibitory neurotransmitters inside that the axon terminal of that inhibitory neuron. There they are. And so when the inhibitory neuron, uh, oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. These are the receptors for the inhibitory neurotransmitters. Uh, remember, receptors are, all, are specific for the molecule they bind to. And so since these inhibitory neurotransmitters are different molecules than the excitatory ones, the target cell has to have you know, different receptors for the inhibitory neurotransmitters. OK, so um, here's a close-up of one of these inhibitory um, uh, neurotransmitter receptors. The inhibitory neurotransmitter receptors are what they call chemical gated chloride channels. Now, um, for a moment, don't worry about the chemical gated part. Uh, chloride means chloride ion. It's, it's, a, it's a CL, uh, it's, a, it's a negatively charged chloride ion. And so what I'm saying is these receptors for the inhibitory neurotransmitters, they bind the inhibitory neurotransmitter and when they do, the receptor opens up a chloride ion channel, a channel that lets in negative ions, chloride ions, into the postsynaptic cell neuron. Um, let's see. So there is one of these inhibitory neurotransmitters. Yes, and when, it, when the receptor binds to that inhibitory neurotransmitter, the recepton ha re receptor has a chloride ion channel, and it starts letting uh, chloride ions, negatively charged ions, into the neuron. Matter of fact, yeah, there we see it right there. Good. So um, this is kind of similar to what we saw for the chemical-gated um, 
sodium ion channels, which are also neurotransmitter receptors, but with these um, neurotransmitter receptors for the inhibitory neurons, they don't let in sodium ions, they let in chloride ions when they bind their, um, uh, their neurotransmitter. Okay, so back to this view here. So remember where we are in this example. Um, enough excitatory postsynaptic potentials were let in so that there's enough positive charge here to open up this voltage-gated sodium ion channel and for, so for the neuron to have its action potential. So everything else being equal, we would expect this neuron to have its action potential, uh, action potential right? But hold on, let's see what how the uh, inhibitory neurotransmitters can affect that outcome. So when the inhibitory neuron has its action potential, it releases these inhibitory neurotransmitters into the synapse. They bind to those receptors for the inhibitory neurotransmitters. And remember, those are chloride ion channels. So they let in negatively charged chloride ions into the, um, uh, into the postsynaptic neuron. And so you're going to get a region of negative charge there, right? Because chloride ions are negatively charged. And we call that region of negative charge that comes from those chloride ions, and we call it an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, or IPSP for short. And so here's the thing. You add up all the negative charges of all the IPSPs that were created from these chloride ions entering, and the negative ionic charges can counter out at the positive ionic charges, right? If you have negatively charged chloride ions, their negative charge can neutralize, can counteract some of the positive charges of these sodium ions here from these EPSPs. And so that is how these inhibitory neurotransmitters working with their receptors can inhibit an action potential because they essentially neutralize some of the positive charges from the EPSPs and that will lower the amount of positive charge that's reaching this first voltage-gated sodium ion potential uh, sodium ion channel and uh, if it if the IPSPs lower the positive charge enough they can stop this from reaching its threshold of negative 55 millivolts thus stopping the uh, action potential from happening right so what we saw before is there was enough positive charge here to push this channel protein past its threshold and open it up and have the action potential if that's all there was, just the EPSPs. But thanks to these IPSPs, these inhibitory ones, some of that positive charge gets neutralized and that can potentially prevent this uh, ion channel from opening up. And matter of fact, let's pretend we had our little volt meter here and let's, let's say this happened. There's enough negative charge here to counteract some of those positive charges so that the overall charge here is negative 63 millivolts. So you tell me, will that voltage-gated sodium ion channel open or not open? And the answer is it will not open, right? Because negative 63 millivolts is below the threshold. It's more negative than the threshold. And these voltage-gated sodium ion channels will therefore be, you know, be shut if it's below the threshold of negative 55. And so, you know, the inhibitory ones worked. There was enough they let in enough negative charge, enough uh, IPSPs to counteract that positive charge from the EPSPs. And so this voltage-gated sodium ion channel did not reach its threshold, so the action potential uh, was inhibited. So uh, if you look at the lecture handout for this, um, it, it summarizes all these concepts. It says that um, what you're supposed to do is you add up, you, you, there's a sum total of all the EPSPs and the IPSPs put together. That determines the, the overall voltage change in, in the postsynaptic uh, neuron. And if you add up all the IPSPs and all the EPSPs, all the negative charges and positive charges, if that sum added up together is enough to have enough positive charge to be above negative 55 millivolts, then this first voltage-gated sodium ion channel will open and the neuron will have an action potential. But if the grand total of adding up all the negative charges in the IPSPs and all the positive charges in the EPSPs, if that grand total is not enough to boost this past the threshold of negative 55 millivolts, then the neuron is inhibited and you don't get uh, the action potential. So that's kind of what we're seeing here.
uh, you know, this neuron right here is, is secreting its excitatory, do we have it? Uh, no, so yeah, there it is. It secretes its excitatory um, neurotransmitters, creating EPSPs, positive electrical charge inside uh, the postsynaptic neuron. This one is secreting its negative, um, its inhibitory neurotransmitters, creating IPSPs, negative charge. And so there, you're going to add up the negative charges and the positive charges, add up the IPSPs and the EPSPs. And if the grand total is enough so that there's higher than negative 55 millivolts at that first voltage gated sodium ion channel, then this neuron does have its action potential. But if the grand total of charge is below negative 55 millivolts, then this voltage gated sodium ion channel does not reach its threshold and therefore the neuron is inhibited from having its action potential. So it all comes down to what's the grand total of voltage when you add up all the IPSPs and all the EPSPs. Okay, well that brings us to the end of this uh, of this second part of the three parts of the nervous system lecture. Um, just to do a super brief recap of what we talked about, we've talked about the nature of the action potential that you see that moves through uh, neurons. Um, you know that it's actually a zone of positive 30 millivolts that moves down the axon and it's it's caused by uh, two major proteins, uh, a voltage-gated sodium ion channel that lets in sodium ions and also some voltage-gated potassium ion channels, the ones I'm showing in blue there, that let out potassium ions. Um, but whether or not these this first voltage-gated sodium ion channel will have its action potential depends on the grand total of excitatory postsynaptic potentials and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials uh, that are created by the excitatory neurotransmitters and the inhibitory neurotransmitters uh, binding to the receptors uh, of, the, of the neuron. Okay, yes, so I will see you in the third and last lecture of this uh, lecture on, on the nervous system.